G'day, welcome back to the channel. It's the day before Remote ID Day. RID minus one, you might say, because tomorrow in the USA, the first part of the FAA's Remote ID rule comes into effect and they will begin enforcement of that first part of the rule. What does it mean to you as a drone or a model aircraft flyer? Absolutely nothing, because there's no responsibility on you to make sure your craft has remote ID. This is the, the first part of the rule, which means that the manufacturers and the suppliers must be selling drones and model aircraft that are remote ID compliant. It's their responsibility to make sure that the stuff they sell has remote ID fitted as standard and cannot be easily disabled. That's what the rule says. So we've seen that with the DJI Avata. As people update the software, remote ID is being activated. I should, remember, should remind everyone that this is in the USA only. But if you don't live in the USA, listen on because as we know, what the USA does today in terms of rules and regulations, the rest of the world does tomorrow. So you're getting a glimpse into the future of what your flying may be looking like in a year or two's time when the regulator in your country catches up to the FAA. So there we go. Um, there's going to be some interesting things happen tomorrow. I've been keeping an eye on the Horizon Hobby website. They're selling a FMS Super Easy bundle ready to fly with everything you need. So under the FAA's regulations, as of tomorrow, if it was manufactured after the 16th of September this year, it must be supplied with standard remote ID. I've seen no sign of that. So I'm going to be checking the website tomorrow and if it's still for sale. Um, the FAA should be asking questions because they'll need to be sure that it was manufactured over three months ago. Or they can't legally sell it without violating the regulations. Interesting times because people say, oh no, 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 they changed that first date from the 16th of September to the 16th of December. So it has to be manufactured before then. No, as far as I can see, reading the regulation, the rule still states that the commencement date is the 16th of September. What the FAA said was our enforcement date is now the 16th of December. So the rule started three months ago. They're just not enforcing it until tomorrow. So craft must manufactured before the 16th of or manufactured after the 16th of September must have standard remote ID and as of tomorrow, FAA says they'll be enforcing that. Woohoo, interesting times ahead. <laughs> but this has really killed the, the RTF fixed wing market. I mean, you, you're not going to be able to manufacture and sell a fixed wing ready to fly plane like the Horizon bundle um, economically when you've got a built in standard remote ID. It's just not going to work because you, we don't have transmitters with built in GPS that can communicate with the planes. Not at the, the entry level point, not at the pricing level at the bottom where RTF, you, product usually sell. So this is going to cripple the hobby. People can't just buy a kid a ready to fly model for Christmas because there won't be any at an affordable price point. That's a real shame. But anyway, moving on from that, let's talk CBOs. As of last week, there was just one CBO. And because a lot of people ask, CBO means community based organization. These are groups that the FAA has recognized and uh, they're able to use their or the, the FAA says that if you want to fly a drone or a model aircraft in the USA, You've got to get part 107, unless there's an exception. The exception says that except if you're flying only recreationally and you follow the programming, safety programming of a CBO. So as I say, last week, the only CBO in town was the AMA. So if you wanted to fly recreationally without breaking a federal regulation, you had to follow their safety program, their guidelines, their rule set. Today, however, there are two more CBOs. There is Flight Test and there is the FPV Freedom Coalition. They both have their own sets of safety programming and you can choose any of the three to operate under but you must operate under one of them so i would recommend the fpv freedom coalition's rule set because they theirs is quite quite small compared to many of the others the fpv freedom coalition is set up basically to support uh, the, the fpv community but the way the faa has screwed this up even if you fly i don't know um thermal saurus, slope saurus, um, aerobatic, um, jets, whatever, you can still uh, you can still operate recreationally under the FPV Freedom Coalition's safety programming, which may have nothing to, at all to say about your particular disciplines, so you're not restricted in any way by those safety guidelines. You're still required to follow the FAA regulations, but the safety guidelines from the FPV Freedom Coalition are quite short, sweet and concise, easy to remember, easy to comply with. Best way to go if you ask me, so it doesn't matter what kind of model you fly, Go to the FPV Freedom Coalition, link in the description, have a look at the programming guidelines and just say, I'm going to use these ones. Simple as. I suspect this may change in the future. I think the FAA shot themselves in the foot here. I think we may find that 
things are not quite the same next year as they are this year. But in the meantime, enjoy a simple, lightweight, easy to follow set of safety programming guidelines. And now an update on the Avatar's remote ID behavior. Now we weren't too sure last time I made a video exactly who was affected and exactly what was gonna happen with the Avatar, but it's become a bit clearer now. There was some talk about the remote ID affecting Canadians as well, but it doesn't seem to. I've had reports from Canada saying, it doesn't affect us, I'm flying my Avatar, no remote ID issues at all. So, it looks like it's solely USA, which makes sense because the regulations in Canada are organized by Transport Canada, not the FAA. So it's, it's the USA, if, if you live in the USA, that's where remote ID affects you. And the Avatar's behavior is such that you cannot arm your drone until you have your smartphone connected because then it's got a GPS in the smartphone. No network connectivity, you don't need a SIM card in your phone, you can switch it to airplane mode if you want to. Um, all it needs is the GPS in your phone to establish where you are standing while you fly the drone. Standard remote ID broadcasts the position of the drone and the pilot. And so if you move around, then your position will be updated in the remote ID broadcast from your drone. That's why your smartphone must be connected. However, however, once you take off, you can unplug your phone. You'll get remote ID error on the screen, but you can wander around to your heart's content. And the broadcast signal from the drone will not know where you are. So it probably broadcasts your last known position rather than your actual position. That's a huge safety feature because if you take off and you walk 50 meters away or 100 meters away, then the remote ID information being broadcast about your position is incorrect. And if Karens are around or someone wants to track you down, it makes their job a whole lot harder. That's what I would do. <laughs> but there's another way too. Because people might want to fly their drones in what are called GPS canyons or areas where there's no GPS coverage, such as underground or in a, a large building on a bottom floor, the DJI Avatar and the whole remote ID system is designed to operate in areas like that. So if your drone can't get a GPS fix, then you can still arm it and fly it. You won't need your smartphone plugged in. Basically, it assumes you're in a, a no, no GPS area. So you're indoors, therefore remote ID isn't a requirement. So it then says, no worries. So I've seen videos on YouTube where people power up their goggles, power up their transmitter, power up their drone, and before the drone gets any satellites, they can arm and fly with no remote ID error or anything like that. We don't know what it's broadcasting, but basically it's not gonna give you an error and you won't need your smartphone connected, so it won't know where you are. All it will be able to broadcast is the home point. And if you, if, if that home point's established after you take off, goodness knows what that'll be. Of course, that may compromise functions such as return to home and so forth, but hey, um, it's a price you have to pay. But there you go. It seems to me actually that the remote ID system on the Avata is very easily uh, compromised, very easily disabled through these options of unplugging your phone or arming before you get GPS. And that doesn't seem to me to meet the, the FAA's requirements that it is not easily tampered with. So I would not be surprised to see the the behavior of the Avata change sometime in the future. At the moment, as I say, if you're flying and you unplug your phone, it will continue to fly, just gives you an error. You can do whatever you like and uh, no problem. I expect that within a reasonably short period of time, there'll be another update for the Avata. And if you unplug your phone while flying, it will GPS return to home and land. And that will be more compliant with what the FAA has dictated. Time will tell on that one, but I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen. And that's about it for today's little roundup, little update. Um, I just want to clarify things, bring you up to date on all the stuff that's happened. And also point out to you that um, there are ways we can push back against this remote ID thing. Um, there's two ways, non-compliance. You can just say, I'm not going to fit remote when it comes to time for the second phase. In September 2023, everyone has to fit broadcast modules on their drones and model aircraft to broadcast their positions. Unless the drone is less than 250 grams or unless you're flying at a freer, you'll have to put those on. Um, you could choose not to comply, then you risk fines because when that happens, the FAA will pick somebody at random and throw the book at them uh, to make an example of them and to create a chilling effect within the community. So they hopefully will think people will now comply because they can see the huge risk of not complying. But there's other ways to work on that. And I'm working feverishly on a plan, which I'll update you about later, which I'm checking the legalities. I think it's 100% legal. I'm running it by a few lawyers to see what they say. And if it is 100% legal, then basically we can disable remote ID, effectively disable it. And if it's disabled and it's not serving any purpose, there is no need for the FAA to continue with this silly, silly burden on model and drone flyers. We'll see what happens. Anyway, in the meantime, thank you for watching. If you want to continue enjoying the fun in the sun, continue watching all the flight videos we put up here. If it's cold and wintry and snowy where you are, it's a great way to get away from the, 
The bleakness of winter, just watch a few fun videos on this channel. And uh, if you're still stuck for things to do, go back through the back catalogue. There are literally over a thousand videos of people having fun with models and drones. And who wouldn't want to watch that? There you go. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye for now. <laughs>